Hey, good morning. It's Wednesday, December the 1st. You're back on Open Mics with Dr. Stites. We're broadcasting live from the Dolph Simons Family Studio here at the University of Kansas Health System. I'm your host, Dr. Steve Stites, Chief Medical Officer here at the Health System. Many people in smaller communities don't always have access to highly trained specialists. Now, that's a struggle for some folks because they live far away. They can have great primary care, but what about all the specialty care that sometimes they'll need? Well, at the University of Kansas Health System, we have what we call the Care Collaborative. It is a patient safety organization dedicated to helping to deliver high quality care to improve the health of those who live in rural Kansas communities. We're going to talk with several of the people who help run that program in just a moment. This is a pretty cool deal. We've been running it for a while here at the health system, and uh, the folks who have helped create that program and run that program are in the studio with us today or online. So we're going to introduce these folks in just a moment. Make sure to get your questions sent in to us on YouTube, Facebook, or the Medical News Network. You'll find links to those right here on your screen. Dr. Hawk is not here yet. I think he's dropping his kids off at school. So we're going to come back to our COVID numbers and some interesting follow-up in just a moment. So let me first see, before we get to our questions around rural health care, let's first see if there are any reporter questions on the line. Okay, I'm not hearing any. All right, well, then that means I get to make a couple of comments about things. So first of all, uh, a little update on Omicron, um, uh, on the Omicron variant. You know, it's interesting. Uh, three days ago, when we started talking about it on Monday, we noted that some of the South African physicians who originally described it in their clinic, primary care physicians, by the way, who um, reported that, gosh, our patients are having different symptoms than they had, and yet they were testing positive. That's how Omicron first was discovered in, in, in South Africa, and people started doing the genomic uh, sequencing and started tracing it. Then later in the week, it has also been reported that, well, some of the kids are starting to have some of the same symptoms as the Delta variant. So there's that thought. So we'll have to see. And again, that's going to be a wait and see approach. Second th thing that popped up was, is it transmitting on air flights? Because when you went from Johannesburg to name your country now, because it's, Omicron is clearly, clearly spreading all over the world, that it was not clear if it, people got it while they were in South Africa or they got in the air flight. That would be a bit of a game changer. If we really, really think we're spreading things a lot on airplanes, that's different than what we thought historically. So we're going to pay a lot of attention to that concept about whether or not Omicron is spreading in planes. But we know that there's still a lot of spread here on the Delta variant, and we know especially that's true in Western Kansas. So before we talk about rural health, I want to spend a moment talking with some of the good folks here today, Dr. Bob Mosier, Dr. Craig Kincannon, and Jody Schmidt. First of all, guys, how are things out in Western Kansas, especially with regard to the spread of the Delta variant? We're gonna get, don't worry, we're gonna talk about rural health care in just a moment. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, unfortunately, the numbers continue to go up. Um, in Saline County, where uh, the medical school branch is at that I'm dean, um, they've seen a, a jump in the number of hospitalizations in the last week. You know, they've been averaging around 12, and it doubled. You know, so Ouch. unfortunately, um, we're still seeing pretty high community spread across western Kansas. And it's kind of odd. You know, when it first started, um, we kind of saw it in the metropolitan areas and moved out to rural. And, and with this uh, new kind of surge, it's it's kind of started western Kansas and moving east. Uh, it appears so. Unfortunately, we're not where we need to be. Yeah, I think that's really true. Dr. Cannon, how are things going out for you and your practice? In Beloit, Kansas, well, I believe, where you're a primary care physician. That's right. Uh, well, we're seeing a pretty consistent uh, COVID on a daily basis. We probably treat uh, uh, three to four at least every day with uh, monoclonal antibodies. Uh, I think our community is very attuned to that, uh, you know, we still kind of fight some of the vaccination issues, but by and large, we're seeing a, a good percentage of patients that are vaccinated come in with COVID symptoms. Uh, and of course, those are at higher risk receive monoclonal antibodies. Um, we have not seen the, the intensity of uh, disease process requiring intubation at all. Most of them have been well supported uh, in the hospital that need to come into the hospital that, that uh, uh, seem to be responding to the traditional treatments so far, but uh, it's pretty consistent. Yeah, I think consistently not as good information as we want to have. 
So let me, I should probably do a better job of introducing our guests as I'm turning to him for just a moment before we get into our real healthcare discussion, trying to get Hawkeye here. So first, Bob Mosier, who is a former family medicine uh, physician, still a family medicine physician. Yeah. You're really not former, are you? But you are the former <laughs> secretary of KDHE. That's true. Yep, and now you're the dean of Salina, this line of campus for the School yep. of Medicine. That's yes. a big deal. Yeah. So, all right, the Dr. Craig Kincannon is with, I said, Internal Medicine in Beloit, Kansas, and Jody Schmidt is Executive Director of our Care Collab Collaborative. Thank you all for joining us today. So what's vaccine yeah. uptake out there in your practice like, Dr. Kincannon? Well, I think our vaccines, I think we're close to 70% uh, in our region. Um, you know, we continue to to try to push the vaccinations. Of course, with this uh, Omicron coming in, uh, it's a, another indication to say, try to get the uh, vaccines going and particularly get the boosters going. Yeah, good good, good plan. And 70% is a great number to hear. What are you yeah. hearing in, in, in Salina and in, in other parts of Western Kansas? Yeah, we're not too far from uh, Dr. Kincannon, uh, and, and it's about like that, at least uh, you know about 70% first dose. Um, it's not where we'd like to see it, and it seems like we get a little bit of an uptake when we see a bump in the unfortunately the number of local deaths. Yeah, um, that seems to draw a little bit more attention that it isn't going away. Yeah, um, and it's it's here. It's a pandemic. Yeah, uh, it's going to continue to mutate. We're going to continue to see problems uh, unless we get our, our handle on it and. Um, the public health measures that we've all been promoting that you do a great job of promoting at the end of every session the vaccinations we've got all the measures to to mitigate but we've got to have participation yeah we do we got to have folks who want to help with that yeah. what are Absolutely. you hearing about out there jody we had a call yesterday afternoon with a group of rural administrators from around the state and chief nursing officers folks are very very busy covid combined with a full hospital of all of the typical things you see this year, some yeah. of them a little earlier this year, is really putting some stress on the facilities out there. Uh, some of them are also starting to have trouble finding someone who will accept their COVID patient and transfer and are having to hold on to patients a little longer as um, as they're providing the care. So it's, it's definitely a challenging time. Some facilities are missing staff uh, from a shortage perspective. And um, just in general, folks are, are feeling that this winter is going to be a tough one out in the rural communities. Uh, they reported yesterday more than 700 patients hospitalized across the state of Kansas, the highest peak since July. Yeah, that's a big deal because those urban areas aren't even in the surge yet. So that's right. a really rural it's, surge that we're seeing. Really a rural surge. Very different than when the last one was. And just to say, we're seeing influenza in Kansas now. So we're not going to get away scot-free like we did last year when we had a get out of jail free card with no influenza in our hospital. We've already got influenza, so it, yes. th that's coming. RSV is here. It, this is going to be a bumpy ride, I think. Mm -hmm. And and you know, to your point earlier, the last surge that we saw, at least here in the Kansas City area, really started in Springfield. It started Springfield, Missouri, nationally, with the outbreak of the Delta variant, spread south and then north. It didn't really. It got into Western Kansas, but not bad. But this time, it's kind of come across from Colorado into Western Kansas. Yeah headed this way our numbers are starting to rise as well and uh at the same time as masks have come off schools are unmasking hopefully people are getting their booster shot we're going to talk about some interesting data about that once hawkeye's here and then also the other thing we're seeing that i think is a little concerning is the rise of the omicron variant which if indeed it is more transmissible we don't know that yet hopefully more mild we don't really know that yet yeah. but that's going to change our milieu a little bit more too i think yes. so I think the next few months are going to be hard. I want us to settle into some pattern we can all get comfortable around so it can be treated more. It's going to be endemic. I think the idea of eliminating SARS-CoV-2 right now is probably going to be difficult because it's mutated so many times already and we never got the world vaccinated. And I think unless we're willing to really make a commitment to vaccinating everybody, it's going to be difficult for us to see an end to it. We just want to have a controlled endemic. Um, other thoughts about any of that? So anything else going on out there that we should know about as far as uh, coronavirus out west? A lot of work with the schools that I'm hearing from the rural facilities. They're partnering with their public health offices. Um, a lot of really wonderful work happening in all these rural communities. But as you said, we've got to get that vaccination yeah. rate up. Too Not everyone sense. has the sort of rights that we heard from Dr. Kincan. Yeah, that's a really good right. I, I, and I'm, I'm going to say it's, I know it's not that high everywhere because the state yeah, of Kansas is not. Is not and not at 70%, so, but um, uh, still better than what have. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about rural care 
as far as how we're doing because we know from the Healthcare Policy Institute it costs about $16 more on average for healthcare expenditures. And that's not the worst part of the news. 29% of those living in rural areas have to pay their healthcare costs out of pocket compared to 23% in urban areas. Now it's not just those in rural areas that are benefiting from the CARE Collaborative here at the health system. There may be some other folks as well. So let's talk to our guests. Help explain what is the CARE Collaborative. Let's start with that, Jody. Okay, happy to, to give you a little bit of background. We started, believe it or not, seven years ago. It's, I think, probably hard for Dr. Mosher and I both it feels to, like decades. to recognize. <laughs> yeah, it feels like decades to you. It yeah. seems like yesterday to me. Um, and our focus started out around time-critical diagnosis, heart attacks, stroke, sepsis, and, and we've trained 78 organizations across 70 counties in Kansas uh, during the seven-year period. We added in heart failure and, and uh, so telebehavioral health services, and then most recently COVID response over the last 18 months. But really our largest program right now is health coaching, where we are connecting patients to a nurse health coach month after month after month, in many cases for years, folks with two or more chronic conditions who are now able to have someone who can help them manage their medications between physician visits, help them understand their physician's plan of care, connect them to transportation services if they need support, and, um, and then connect them to resources like prescription assistance, meals on wheels, um, all the sort of support that a patient needs between those physician visits. And the good news is that also turns out to not just be really great for patient care, but also very cost effective and efficient. In fact, we have found that that reduces the total cost of care by 21 to 22% compared to patients with similar conditions who don't get this kind of support. Um, we've now done more than 62,000 health coaching visits across the communities that we're working in, and we're finding it's really been a phenomenal addition to the services that we provide as a care collaborative. Dr. Roger, that's got to kind of make you swell with pride as a former secretary of KDHE and something we think, gosh, we should do more of. No, absolutely. Um, you know, that was what really uh, excited me to, to take the move away from KDH&E, uh, working with some great folks there, but uh, to join the health system and, and uh, what was the Heart and Stroke Collaborative at that time. Uh, because we knew we had higher mortality rates of heart attack and stroke in rural Kansas, higher readmission rates, and a number of factors that drive that. Um, and so to be able to kind of work with our partners out in rural Kansas who, uh, having been a rural provider, and, and uh, Dr. Kincannon can certainly speak to this, but. We work with limited resources. There's not a lot of people uh, in and with expertise uh, to kind of help support us and a lot of times uh, understaffed and so they're running as fast as they can. So when you ask them to do one more thing, hey, let's just focus on this. You can imagine it's a deep breath and you know trying to decide do they have that uh, capacity. Um, but these folks stepped up and uh, the work that they're doing out in the front lines across rural Kansas, our partners that are, are, are part of this uh, care collaborative, have done the work and uh, committed to, to providing good quality care and um, but they needed the information you know and they needed the support and it's been great that the health system's been part of that. Yeah thank you and Dr. Kincannon you as a primary care physician out in Beloit uh, tell us the impact the care collaboratives had on you your patients your practice. You know I think it's been it's been excellent it's really one of the things that's kind of broken down the silos of the county hospitals and it's it's been nice because it gives us uh, opportunity to communicate across different counties in the in the rural areas. We know that we give good good care in rural areas, and this has just been an opportunity to show that, and not only show that the care is good, but also that the the cost effectiveness of that care is excellent. And uh, so it's been it's had a halo effect, I think, on the rest of the care within within the hospital systems. It's kind of brought the hospitals and physicians and county health departments in into the picture as a unit and it gives us a source of pride that we can show these things in, in numbers where it's always been difficult to get numbers in rural areas because of, of really volume so it's been a very positive experience for us yeah dr Bush, you talk to more a little bit about the type of services that are offered to some of these practices yeah, most of it's really uh, taking their data and kind of looking at, uh, you know, how they're doing on managing uh, certain time critical diagnoses. Uh, so we use mostly national benchmarks, so there's not a lot of debate around uh, what we're looking at. Um, 
But we take the evidence-based guidelines, put them into protocols, and then adapt them to local realities. Um, so uh, managing a heart attack uh, or unstable angina is uh, some of the uh, first conditions we looked at. Acute ischemic stroke, uh, which then evolved into the transient ischemic attack uh, patients and, and anybody with acute neurologic change, how do we assess them? How do we start the workup uh, and whatnot? Um, and so just having uh, a, an understanding of the evidence-based guidelines, developing the protocols, uh, developing the network of who to communicate with, who to reach out to first, um, was all uh, pretty effective in, in getting these implemented and starting to see results. Um, as Jody mentioned, we started in late 2014, and, and by March of 2015, we had everybody that was initially a part of this that had adopted those protocols using them, and we were starting to pull data, and, and within that first six months, we were seeing significant improvement in the time measures of, of managing these uh, time-critical diagnoses. And so uh, as we spread out uh, so quickly, and CMS allowed us to scale up to adding other counties and other conditions, one of our rural providers suggested sepsis um, as another time-critical diagnosis we should focus on. So we took over some of the uh, educational components and, and measures that Dr. Steve Simpson here at the health system started with, with his Stop Sepsis campaign, which, you know, turns out to be uh, fortuitous with the fact that we've been dealing with a sepsis syndrome in the way of COVID, you know, for the last two years yeah, almost. You know. And so, uh, but we, we moved that into long-term care settings um, because we were seeing about 50% of our cases of septic shock coming into rural communities coming from long-term care. We had a lot of facilities that took up screening for that <clears throat> and developing protocols. And uh, so as uh, you know, we've been able to gather the data, look at it, see the improvement, it's, it's really been exciting to see, you know, that the effort that they're putting in in the front lines is really making a difference. Well, I think it's a, it's a great example, especially on time-sensitive diagnoses of that, because we know the longer you wait to get the right measures, the worse your outcomes are. Yes. So it's a stroke, heart attack, infection that's spread in your bloodstream, which is what sepsis is. If, if, if as I understand this, really, it's, it's our, some of the, 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 the protocols that people that here are working with folks locally, be they nurse practitioners, primary care physicians, or others, to try and make sure, hey, here's the next step, here's the next step, here's the next step. Things we see all the time, other people may not see as much. That way we can help work with each other to get deliver the best care. Yeah, absolutely. So, Jody, has, you've talked about how this has reduced the cost of care for people yes. in rural areas. Talk to us a little bit more. What, what's an average cost of one of these admissions like, and how much of that does a patient have to pay for? Well, we're very excited about uh, working with the Medicare program. We've been able to bring this to patients at no cost to them. So the Medicare program last year, for example, saved $10 million because of the work that we're doing, right. and they cover much of the cost. Um, supplemental insurance covers part of it, and we write a lot of grants so that we don't have to ask patients to pitch into the cost of this care. But by avoiding one emergency room visit, by avoiding, some of, some of our patients have had five or six hospitalizations in a year, by helping them stay healthy, helping them stay on track, um, and also helping identify what motivates them around doing the right things for their health care. For one of our patients, it was getting back on his Harley. For another, it's in the garden. For some folks, it's been able to get in and out of the church pew on their own. What is it that motivates them to really work with us, with our nurse health coaches and their physicians, to do well? And now we've even been able to add Bluetooth devices so we can check on their blood pressure and blood glucose, et cetera, between physician visits. So um, it's really been very cost effective which is why Medicare is so supportive of this program. But it also, you know, it's that win-win. We're doing the right thing for the patient, is also good for the Medicare program. And we were able to bring $4.3 million of shared savings back to our rural clinics and share it with them. So a win-win all the way around. Yeah, that's a really big win. And Dr. Kikannon, are you the one that recommend the patient go back on their Harley? I just want to be clear about that. <laughs> yeah, that's right, yeah. <laughs> Um, so, uh, so is, is there a success story or with one patient that you can tell us that this clearly made a difference in their lives by chance? Well, be, to, to say just one patient would be misrepresentative of really what it does. But honestly, there's so many patients that come into the emergency room with sepsis and, and acute MIs. And, you know, the, the real challenges is that you know, once COVID hit is the transportation issues to get some of these acute 
uh, time critical diagnosis transferred to appropriate places, that's become more of the challenge. Uh, up to that point, I think everything, many patients benefited from the processes that we we do, but uh, the COVID issues and the uh, hospitals being full and not being able to accept transfers has been really a challenge for rural medicine, I think. Yeah, that that is that is a tough challenge. Hawkeye, welcome aboard this yeah. morning, sir. Yeah, hi. We're gonna switch gears for a minute before we go to questions and just talk a little bit about what's going on here at the health at the med center. Yeah. At uh, in our hospital, what what are our numbers like today, sir? You know, we'll start off with uh, Hayes. They still have 16 active patients, eight, in that recovery period, so a total of 24. We here at the hospital have 27 active infections, seven in the ICU, three on the ventilators. Uh, 13 in that recovery period, so a total of 40. But of those 27 active in patients, seven are fully vaccinated, and that's why I kind of want to talk about that a little bit more. In those people that are vaccinated, they have an older age, 65 and above. They have immune suppression, lung transplant, kidney transplant, significant heart and lung disease. And so I think that owes uh, to some of those people. Uh, there is one vaccinated that is also here for a different reason as well. So Yeah, I think we got that list. And it's just, a, there's a 52 year old, these are all people who are vaccinated. First of all, all the ones who are here and vaccinated are overdue for their booster shot. Yeah. Second of all, 52 year old male, to your point, kidney transplant and heart history. A 70 year old who um, has worsening pneumonia, a 65 year old who's had a bilateral lung transplant, mm -hmm. and uh, a 73 year old with a kidney transplant, a 51 year old with severe diabetes. And again, all of those folks are people who've had a delay in getting their booster. And three out of yeah. the five that I just mentioned yes. are folks who've been transplanted. So we know that that group is especially at risk. We know that transplant and advanced autoimmune disease really need a series of three shots with the messenger RNA mm -hmm. vaccine, for example, and followed by a booster after that. And so uh, it's just, you know, we got to, the more you follow it, the better off you are. And just to say in the ICU, not so many vaccinated patients. These are all folks who are just here and have COVID. Yep, yeah, and that was my point too. Those five vaccinated patients patients you just uh, ran through with those uh, risk factors are on the regular medical floor. They're not in the ICU critical care unit. Yeah, the number there for the ICU patients is zero vaccinated, seven not vaccinated. On the mechanical ventilators, zero vaccinated, three who are not vaccinated. So once again, the vaccines continue to protect us against severe illness and death. Hey, I mentioned Omicron a little bit. Anything you want to update us about the Omicron today? No, you know, I just, I've been thinking about it a lot in the last uh, 24 hours since we went through those. Yesterday we showed that, that quick graph or, or, or um, the list of different mutations that Omicron has in the spike protein with some of the other uh, some of the other variants as well. You know, I'm going to be optimistic in saying that Although a lot of the immune evasion we have been talking about is antibody, and I don't think that's um, unheard of or surprising as we know that any changes in spike could uh, really confer then reduced antibody uh, immunity. But I think, you know, I think there are those still those regions that don't change, don't know how much they've changed on Omicron spike, uh, but I'm really optimistic that our T cell immunity from the vaccines uh, and also maybe from natural infection are really going to protect us and continue to reduce the risk, albeit maybe that reduction is a little bit smaller than, uh, than it would have been with some of the other variants, but it'll still reduce our risk of hospitalization. Yeah, I, I think that's probably where we're going to land. I think early indications are showing some of that. And then the other point is it's probably uh, it, it now reports in Europe are that it has been circulating since October. Mm. So that's four to six mm -hmm. weeks ago. You know it's here in the United States. We just have to f figure out where it is because we have yeah. flights directly from Johannesburg into some of our major cities, and so it, 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 it's here. We just have to we just have to mm -hmm. look for it and find it, and and uh, uh, and we'll see. And and, and we've heard, heard everything from oh this is going to be the worst thing. It's you know super super bad to oh gosh maybe this is actually good news because it's more it maybe more transmissible and it'll displace Delta, but it's not as so. I, I think it's so darn early. We have no idea what the story is really going to be yeah. and that's why i say right now it's kind of the oh my gosh variant <laughs> we should have to be yeah. careful how we react to it as opposed to the omicron variant so jess let's see what questions you got out there hey good morning okay rebecca says can stites and hawkeye i love that they now refer to you as you're, you're on a nickname basis 
Stites and bet. Hawkeye speak to boosters lowering your white uh, blood cell count. She's got her booster and then two days later had her CBC done and her white blood count was two. She said she wouldn't change that she got the booster. She's glad she did, but just curious if that's a normal immune response. Yeah, Hawk, I'm not sure. What are, you, what are your thoughts um, here? Yeah, I, I could see that mechanism. You know that certainly when you have infection, when your uh, immune system is, is fighting active infection, we know that you can have a reduction in certain classes of your immune cells. Um, we also know that our ranges in our, in our blood tests of white blood cell counts, those are ranges. Those are what most people fall under. But there is that statistical probability that at any one time you could fall above or below that range. Most of them are transient, meaning short-lived, and they do spontaneously resolve or go back into that normal range. So I really wouldn't pay too much attention to that. If you have concerns, certainly speak with your, your medical team and your physician. You're welcome to go get another, uh, another blood test. Uh, but overall, I, I don't know that, that it's too clinically significant, and I wouldn't be too concerned about that. Yeah, and I, I, I think that's probably right. It, you know, viruses do lower our white count when we get them, Sometimes, and so maybe yeah. that has something. But I wouldn't, I'm not, I wouldn't be at all concerned. It'll bounce right back. Anne has a question for our guests. Are you also working with pediatric needs in rural areas? Great question. What's the answer to that, Jody? It is a great question. Actually, perfect timing for me to mention mm -hmm. that we're launching a new program starting in January, and we're working right now with Children's Mercy to develop protocols to support both pediatric and adult diabetes care across our rural areas. So we've spent the last uh, couple of months working very closely with their team, and as we've done that, and, and we've um, shared with them our process is about taking education, training, and protocols to the local rural communities. They seem very very excited to start joining us in our work. Yeah, that, that, that is interesting. So do you have to be in a rural area to be part of the Care Collaborative, Dr. Fosier? No, not at all. We, uh, we have some uh, what we call PPS hospitals. Uh, so uh, some of our regional Explain referral, what a PPS hospital uh, is. Yeah, perspective payment system. So, okay, that um, makes complete sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's, it's a federal program. You so. sorts. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, yeah, so uh, no, a lot of our rural hospitals, uh, you know, are critical access, so they have a, a cost-based reimbursement model uh, like r rural health clinics and, and, uh, and such. But, but no, we've got uh, uh, regional referral hospitals. HazeMed uh, was one of our original partners for the Kansas Heart and Stroke Collaborative. Uh, Pratt Regional Hospitals, uh, a member. So, no, you don't have to be what most people would think of as uh, rural and small and isolated to be part of the care collaborative. And obviously, University of Kansas Health System's uh, a part of the care collaborative, mm -hmm. a big part. So, are you saying we're not rural and isolated at KU? Uh, not necessarily, no. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> there you and go. And Garden City, Salina yes. Regional. Um, we really are, are trying to work with entire regions so that the rural hospital uh, is working from the same hymnal, so to speak, as the regional center where they get their specialty support for cardiac stroke, sepsis care, and then, of course, how they can work with our team when they need what only we at the Academic Medical Center can provide. So we really try and look at the whole continuum and connect everybody around the evidence so that everybody is providing that same high-quality care. Yeah, such a, that's quite an advance. Dr. Kincannon, how rural is Beloit? Well, we're at about 4,000, and we have, probably have a service area of 12,000, 15,000 in our region. Uh, so we, we've been, we're pretty fortunate. We have six physicians in town and then the surgeon as well. So we kind of provide that broad-based primary care and we have been a tissue care unit and have been able to um, create kind of a COVID unit in our hospital system. So how many, beds is, how many beds is your hospital? You're a critical access hospital? We are critical access. We have 25 beds capability staffing is an issue now and we've had to kind of cut back on the number of patients we accept because of that but yeah staffing is an issue across the country right now in healthcare. i mean that that's something we need to take on in this discussion sometimes is the impact of staffing shortages in healthcare because it is significant isn't it how many beds are you limited to, to right now by staff right now we have on the floor plus four icu so for 14 okay. beds but basically yeah you're about to say something. I, I cut you off. I no, apologize. No, you're absolutely right. Uh, you know, we hear that. We've heard it since the beginning of COVID. And, and some of it was related to folks getting ill. And, and, and some of it now is not only, you know, that they got COVID and had to take time off, but 
uh, they're just burned out. You know, they're really frustrated uh, with uh, the workload. It, it hasn't let up, and, and they don't see the light at the end of the tunnel, obviously, with new variants coming along. And the slow uptake in vaccinations, uh, the controversy that's been surrounding, you know, how to, how to manage COVID has yeah. just really uh, frustrated. We hear that echo through all of our calls. And um, so we're going to have a shortage here. We're, we're going to have people retire early. We're going to have folks who want to do something else that feels more rewarding, um, which I, you know, in healthcare, I, I don't know what that would be, but uh, uh, I can yeah, much, certainly, yeah. from what I'm hearing, uh, hear their frustrations and, and they're looking. So we, we need, you know, we are an academic institution, both nursing, physicians, you, you name it, we train them all, right? But um, we need to be ready, I think, to step up to fill the gap because it's, it's coming. Yeah. So from an administrative standpoint, nursing staff, et cetera, shortage throughout Kansas, though? Shortage throughout Kansas, absolutely. And um, our members have said, as Dr. Mosier indicated, that the nurses in particular, but, but providers in general, are reaching that, that stage of burnout. So we're working right now with a team we have here um, at the Academic Medical Center, Turning Point, who do some work around resiliency with our nursing floors and, and other providers here in Kansas City. And we're working to be able to expand that out into the rural areas so we can provide some added support, um, really helping people manage their stress, understanding ways to help them really develop a sense of resiliency so they can bounce back when they've had those really tough days. Because, you know, in that rural hospital, there are times where they may be the only RN in the building when a, a crisis walks through the emergency room door. It can be a very stressful environment. And we want to develop some additional programs to help folks really um, to to help them be their best in those challenging situations. Jess? Isaac has another question for our panel. Um, in Kansas and many other states, a lot of rural hospitals had been closing or at least performing poorly for many years, even before the pandemic. Why might that be? And what is being done to counter that longstanding trend? Uh, that's a great question and certainly some a struggle we faced here in Kansas, Dr. Mosher. And again, you've spent this time, you wrestled with this as secretary of KDHE. <laughs> yeah. And now we have like some of the most, I mean, the highest number of rural access, I think, hospitals per geographic, whatever the right yeah. thing is. Mm -hmm. we, we have a lot of rural access hospitals at risk in Kansas. We, we do. And, and I'll, I'll defer uh, to Jody on, on this, but, but we do have, and historically we've had some, um, rural hospitals that have struggled financially uh, for a number of reasons. A lot of it has to do with decreasing populations, uh, the move from uh, more inpatient type care to more outpatient driven, um, and, and just not being able to deliver some of those uh, service lines in a rural setting, so they have to refer them on to a larger, more regional hospital for that. So the loss of some of that revenue is, is, has been challenging. but. A number of other reasons, but uh, Jody served as president uh, of the National Rural Health Association. She's a former hospital administrator, uh, which means she had to put up with uh, physicians like Dr. Kincannon and myself. Uh, <laughs> and KDHE. And, and, and KDHE, yeah, <laughs> and KDHE. And, &E. and so, but uh, Jody, you, you know the more recent numbers. Well, unfortunately, I do get a report from the National Rural Health Association every year, and year in and year out, Kansas ranks among the top three in terms of the most rural hospitals considered financially at risk. Mm -hmm. And the way they determine that is they take a look at the factors of those hospitals that have closed, and it's been more than 100 hospitals that have closed in, since 2010. Um, and when they look at that figure, and the most in 2020 as a result of the impact of the pandemic, when you look at the factors that led to that and then you apply it to our Kansas hospitals, we are very fortunate that rural communities have stepped up and made their local hospitals whole to the best of their ability. But there is a limit to how much a local community can do through the local tax base to support their hospital. And there have been um, continual cuts in reimbursement since 2010 that have just added to the challenges of the rural facilities. You add in staffing shortages and, and the high rates that they have to pay to get contract staffing to come in and help them through those processes. It's just a challenging time to be a rural administrator. And um, here in Kansas, we, we do have a large number of critical access hospitals, um, more than 80 in our state, and unfortunately, a significant number of them, um, more than half of them are considered financially at risk. Dr. Kincannon, talk to us a little bit about how's the hospital in Beloit doing, and what would it mean to the community if that hospital had to close? 
Well, we've been fortunate. I think we're probably as stable as, as any critical access hospital. And that's because the community supported us for many, many years. And and um, they, they recognize the importance of having the, the hospital system that they have and and, and supporting that system. Uh, I'm telling you, if, if this hospital would uh, become financially at risk and have to close, the whole region would, would suffer. We serve as... Uh, as I said, about 15,000 people in this North Central Kansas region. Um, and to, to lose this, I don't know how that you would be absorbed by Salina or, or Hayes uh, because of their, they can't really handle the load they've got right now. So it would impact us, of course, economically. It's, it's a big economic boost for, for our uh, community, uh, having people come to town for their health care. So. Uh, it would be a tremendous loss. Yeah, I think that is a danger and a threat we have to work with and continue to try and find ways because of, I think one of your points you made is if real, uh, if people aren't spending as much time inpatient, it's hard for the hospitals to generate as much revenue. So how do they supply, how do they replace that revenue? Is there an outpatient thing that they can do? How, how do rural access hospitals deal with that? Yeah, a lot of them do try to find service lines that they can provide, uh, which often means they, they have to rely on regional specialists to come in and deliver those services. Um, and uh, if, if they can, uh, that, that certainly helps to find additional revenues. But as you um, see a lot of our rural communities, uh, their population age 65 and over is increasing faster than that age 18 to 64. And we know after age 65, you tend to utilize health services a little bit more. Yeah, unfortunately. And so, yeah, so you, you've got, um, you know, a, a smaller number of, of population left to deliver some of those services to that elderly population. So uh, the, not only the health system delivering the health care, but uh, what about the care once they return home? And I think that's where we found our chronic care management with our health coaches to be so impactful in some of these rural communities is that's the tie between the uh, visits with their provider. Jess. Dr. Seitz, this question is actually to our community from one of our community members, and it's really in the spirit of helping out our local small businesses, as we know that they're str still struggling and trying to recover. But Craig wants to know, with the reduced mass requirements, I'm going out to businesses less. Is there a central site or resource location, a directory of businesses that do require masks? So if That's anyone knows question. of that, it really is. And so if anyone knows of that, let us know on the panel, but also out in our community, you know, pop that into the thread so that people can know where to go. Cause we know there's so many immunocompromised people. Yeah, who I've not, I've not thought about that before. And uh, anybody here, have you guys heard anything like that? No, no. I think Hawk, no, it's a great I idea. Uh, besides um, state or federal places of business, or um, healthcare facilities. I wouldn't imagine a lot of private businesses would, would require, um, but certainly I think they would be optional for those. So I think that's a great question. I don't know the answer. Yeah. All right, okay. community, we're counting on you. Okay, so here's another good question. Isaac says, I, I fear that by the time it takes to distribute an updated vaccine, another mm -hmm. variant's just going to arise during that time and we'll be endlessly chasing variants from here on out what are your thoughts you know this is a great question mm -hmm. it, it really strikes at the heart of mm -hmm. where we are in this pandemic mm -hmm. the reality is we're somewhere between a pandemic which we still have an endemic uh, SARS-CoV-2 SARS-CoV-2 is going to be with us mm -hmm. right unless there's some major event or new therapy that's developed SARS-CoV-2 is with us the goal has got to be to minimize the impacts we can have a life as normal. And every time we get close to life as normal, it feels so darn good. And you just want to keep that going. So how do we get there? How do we do it? And I think the answer is multifold. First of all, we're going to have to realize that we are going to have to modify what is normal for quite a while and just accept that and try and say, okay, it's still good. It may not be what I wanted in the past, but it can still be good. Mm -hmm. And I think the biggest thing you just have to be thoughtful of is, you know, if you're gonna go into a crowded public space, put on a mask and make sure you get your vaccinations. Those are the two things you can do to help minimize the impact of the pandemic, even as it becomes an endemic. The second thing we have to do is remember there's always hope and science, faith, mm -hmm. hope, science. We talk about that a lot in this program. 
because um, yesterday Hawkeye, a big step, even though it's not a great drug and the FDA panel was mm -hmm. split, mm -hmm. it was they, they still approved um, the new Molnupivir, mm -hmm. or however you yeah. say it correctly, the Merck pill for the antiviral mm -hmm. pill. I think the Pfizer pills we're going to hear about in two more weeks. I think that Pfizer pill may be a mm -hmm. knockout, and by all indications, yeah. Omicron is going to be susceptible. So I do think that those antiviral pills are going to change the face. I hope, fingers mm -hmm. crossed, I think that's going to change the face of both the pandemic and the endemic SARS-CoV-2. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think the key to those pills is extremely early in instituting uh, taking those medicines after symptoms arise, and sometimes that may not always happen. As far as are we chasing variants? Well, you know, for uh, 18 months now, we've seen variants start to arise, and that started back, I think, in in March or April of 2020 when we had that first major change in the spike protein. Um, since that time, we've had different variants come out during the time of vaccines, and we know that Moderna initially went ahead to start looking at research for that, that South African, I think, is that beta? Yeah, the, the beta. Uh, to, so using a spike for that. But what it turned out is our vaccines, both the adenovirus vector vaccine, but also the mRNA vaccines, when given appropriately to those eligible patients, continue to work effectively to reduce hospitalization, severe disease, and death. Now, there is that concern that for this, it hasn't, but every variant prior to Omicron, we know that you still have very good protection against those variants. And so, again, I'm being optimistic because of the past results. Uh, that is no way indicative of future results. But I think with some of our T cell immunity that is induced very well uh, by those vaccines, we are still going to have a significant reduction in your risk of hospitalization from these current vaccines. But if not, we know the, uh, we know the vaccine manufacturers can pivot quite quickly. Uh, but I don't know that we're going to have to be chasing all the time as we have because, uh, you know, we haven't seen it in the past. We know that the vaccines that are available have protected us against the other variants that have arisen. Uh, and so I, I'm using that as in being optimistic about that. Yeah, and in fact, in point of fact, exactly to what you're saying, we've not had to pivot yet. Yeah. Uh, so the, vir the, the vaccines are the same as the ones that were originally produced because they have worked very effectively. And again, the real key here is, does it protect against severe hospitalization and death? And we gave you our numbers just a while back about how many vaccinated patients are on the ventilator and how many vaccinated patients are really sick. The answer is zero. The, things, the people who are vaccinated are just on regular yeah. hospital floor, and they're all immunocompromised. Yep. So, you know, we may need a different vaccine strategy for the immunocompromised, i.e., you got to make sure you get three, a series of three shots plus a, a booster, not, and you can't let yourself go too long without getting your booster. So, I, But I think that, 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 that they still, the vaccines are still really working well. Yeah. You know, Pfizer, the, the CEO for Pfizer came out and said yesterday that they believe that the Pfizer-BioNTech uh, vaccine will still work against mm -hmm. the Omicron variant. Yeah. Now, maybe he's being overly optimistic, but I, I think he's trying to make a point, which is, look, there's antibody mediated immunity, and there, there are all these other types of immunity. You always talk about the T cells, Hawk, that it still looks like that combination mm -hmm. of our immunity is going to be what's most successful, and it still looks like it's probably going to be good, even yeah. in the face of, oh my gosh, or I mean, Omicron. Yep. And, and you know, I also don't want to um, uh, diminish the natural immunity that we get from natural infection. Now, we don't want that to happen because we saw what happened in the pre-vaccine era with so many people infected, uh, so many people going to the hospital, so many people losing their lives be and they didn't have to, but also those long-term consequences, long COVID, things of that nature. So certainly vaccine is the safest way to go, but we are learning more about natural infection and, and what happens at reinfection and what the immune response is and what the overall clinical um, scenario and, and outcomes for that is as well. That's a big deal. And to your point earlier, Jody. We're at the highest peak since what for total hospitalization since in Kansas? Mm -hmm. oh, that's a big number. I don't like that peak. Can we find a different peak to be on? I wish we could. Yeah. Uh, a vaccine mm -hmm. peak. I like the vaccine peak. Good plan. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Dr. Good Cannon, did you have something you wanted to add? I did not. Okay. No. Jess. A couple more questions. Oh, um, this is from Catherine. Earlier on, one of our guests said 70% vaccinated. Is that the entire population, adults, or those who are eligible? Yeah, great question, isn't that, uh, Dr. Roger? Yeah, no, that, that's a, a good question. And um, 
Uh, just as you were starting to, to explain uh, that question, I was sitting there trying to remember what I was looking at yesterday. I think it's probably total population. Yeah, because and I, I, I know there were kids yeah. in there were not that high. Kansas, yeah. I think, is around 52, 50%. I, I think I was looking more at the uh, original adult population and, and not uh, the total, which in, would incorporate the, the kids, the school aged children that are now eligible. Yeah, and, and, and Dr. Kukannon, how about your practice? You said 70%, which is a great number. And I, I, if you are, we're going to call you the vaccine maestro. You got to come to Kansas City and work well, with uh, I don't know if they're vaccine maestro. Again, that's the adult population that, that we were referring to. Uh, I would say the uptake on the kids being vaccinated is slower a little bit here in our community, but it's still active. You know, the interesting thing with our community is that our football team was relatively good this year. And, and uh, what stimulated the uh, vaccination within the, with, in the school system was is if we're going to win state football championship, we're not going to be locked out because uh, we didn't have vaccination. So there was really a big push to get everybody vaccinated, and I think that was pretty effective. Uh, and so that was that was an interesting sideline there. Yeah, the United States. I was just pulling up for all all states, all ages. Seventy percent of our population has had one dose. Fully vaccinated, fifty nine percent. Twelve and up is eighty percent. One dose and 69% fully vaccinated and 65 and up is greater than 99%, at least one dose, and 86% with fully vaccinated. So um, go get your full vaccination. Don't stop. Yeah. That, that, that's, a, that's a big deal. Okay, Jess. Two quick questions. Okay. Um, Jan wants to know, she says, a friend of hers recently had heart surgery, and the doctors only want him to get the J&J. &J. Why would they not want him to have higher protection? Uh, lots wrapped up into that question. Thoughts, yeah. Hawkeye? Yeah, so again, if it's you as an individual, really talk with your medical team. I think in general for this question, um, I would have to imagine they are concerned about myocarditis. However, we know um, that certain age groups, especially those younger age groups, I think it was 18 to 24 doctor sites, that had the higher, highest risk of that post-vaccine myocarditis, which again, for the most part is transient, very short-lived, resolves spontaneously. But we know that your risk of that myocarditis after true infection is much greater than any vaccine. Um, certainly, uh, without knowing your full medical history, um, I do understand if it, w if it was my father with just uh, coronary artery disease or post-heart attack or post-heart surgery, I would probably prefer the mRNA vaccine for the overall protection. But again, that is something you really need to tease out the details with your medical team. Oh, hey, here's the data for Kansas. I had to pull out the New York Times website. Um, all ages, actually, you guys, 66% have had one dose now in the state of Kansas. So we're not that far off from what you're all saying. 55% are fully vaccinated. For 12 and up, 77% have had one dose. 65% are fully vaccinated. And 65 and up, 99% have had one dose. 87% fully vaccinated. So actually, Kansas rallied. Good. All right, Jess, one last question. Okay, it's a combo question, mm -hmm. but I think it's quick. Um, no, Ashley and Craig have a combo, and it's, is the advice to still wait six months after your second dose to get the booster? And can you just walk in and get your boosters, or do you still have to make appointments? Do we know? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I would certainly wait. I think longer is better. Again, that does give your uh, full immune response, your T cells, your B cells, continue time to evolve and create those new uh, combinations of, of different broad spectrum uh, and neutralizing antibodies. So I think the longer you can wait um, past that six months is always going to be better. And from what I understand, you know, we do have a good supply of vaccine in our country. And so certainly you can walk in probably to either a physician's office or any uh, commercial pharmacy and try to get that. Um, I think a lot of the pharmacies maybe have appointments, but when we say walk in, that's essentially what that would mean, yeah. Okay, let's go around the horn for our final thoughts. Dr. Mosier, I'm gonna start with you, sir. Well, uh, I would be amiss if I didn't uh, say thanks uh, to all of our uh, rural partners and regional hospital systems out there that have supported us in the Heart and Stroke Collaborative, the Care Collaborative, uh, inviting us in and letting us work with you. 
uh, to see these great results we've got. We are excited to continue the work and uh, we uh, hope with everybody getting vaccinated, we can get back out into the communities again. I miss uh, our road trips uh, to be in those facilities because I think you really get a better feel for some of the challenges they, they face and a better understanding of what services they can provide and whatnot. So thank you for uh, letting us work with you and look forward to further engagement. Yeah, and, and thanks for all the great work you've done uh, and, and, and the great public service you, you, you've given us. Um, Dr. Craig Kincannion how, uh, from Internal Medicine Beloit, Kansas, final thoughts. Well, I just I want to thank KU for reaching out and, and seeing the importance of, of having a concerted effort to bring everybody under a wing of, of quality care and excellence of care. And without your support and direction, the good things that have happened with Bob's leadership really wouldn't have happened. But it's been, it's really very telling that it, this all started before the COVID pandemic and without that, that development the response in rural Kansas to the COVID pandemic would not be as strong. Uh, KEU stepped up and the collaborative stepped up to kind of help us deal with that. So it's been very awesome and, and, and very important into the care of the patients that we've gotten so far. So I would just continue to push for vaccinations and, and um, continue to thank you guys for all that you've done to help us. Oh, thank you. I appreciate those kind words, Jody. Like Dr. Mosier, I'd like to, to thank all of our rural partners who have worked very hard prior to the pandemic to really um, measurably improve care and demonstrate what high quality care is provided in our rural communities and have gone above and beyond during the pandemic. And our care collaborative team. Um, we're a small but mighty team who um, provide support to a continually growing membership and they've done some phenomenal work, particularly during the pandemic, but throughout our, our entire seven years. Yeah, that has been great work. And by the way, Jill, I don't know if you're listening out there, I know you are, and Jess, Got to get these three back because we didn't even talk about telemedicine with this mm -hmm. part of the conversation today. Shame mm -hmm. on us, but we need to bring them back so we can have that part of the conversation. Yeah. Hey, Dr. Seitz. Yes. Dr. Seitz, just really quick on that note before we get to Dr. Hawkinson, uh, we just had a really nice comment. Daryl said, this continues to be one of the best conversations on these type mm -hmm. of issues. Mm -hmm. So he just says he really appreciates it. So we just really appreciate our guests today and, and yes, people do. are listening and we love that. Yeah. Yeah. I actually know somebody from Beloit. It's a very small yeah. community, but my friend Michelle Reeder from uh, known her decades since I was at KU. But uh, yeah, it's a small, really close knit community for sure. Uh, you know, again, I think everybody is concerned about Omicron. We know information is coming out um, hopefully soon about immunity and vaccines and all that. Um, please, if you haven't gotten vaccinated yet, please go get your vaccines. Try to keep everybody safe for these cold winter months and the holidays. Um, and that's the best advice we can give right now. You know, just make sure um, as we enter into this great discussion about the Omicron variant, don't turn it into the oh my gosh variant. Mm -hmm. Don't panic, don't get into a frenzy. Remember, the rules of infection prevention and control, they travel with you wherever you go, they keep you safe, even up onto this moment and every moment going forward. You can stay safe if you follow the rules, if you get vaccinated, that will be the greatest gift you can give to anyone throughout this holiday season. So don't, don't, don't waffle. Stay strong. It's going to be okay. We've got new hope on the horizon. The Pfizer pill, the Merck pill, antibodies, vaccines, masking. We know how to master this moment. Jess, back to you. All right, Dr. Stites, great conversation today. Thank you all for joining us. Coming up tomorrow, sleep, as we know, is precious no matter how and when we are able to get it. But COVID, as we know, has caused a lot of people to lose valuable shut-eye. We've got some great advice from a sleep expert on how to cope. We'll also take a look at how a recall involving a CPAP machine is impacting patients here in our area. And today is World AIDS Day. As we head out today, let's take a look at some of the key events over the past 40 years since the start of the HIV AIDS epidemic. Everyone have a great day. The lifestyle of some male homosexuals has triggered an epidemic of a rare form of cancer. Run what?
says he gets very lonely. He misses his friends. The 13-year-old was banned from school after it was found he was suffering from AIDS. AZT was tried as a means to prevent the virus from reproducing itself in the body's healthy cells. And it worked. She died today of a respiratory illness related to the disease. Subscribe to our Morning Medical Update and Open Mics with Dr. Stites Podcasts. Now everywhere podcasts are available. <laughs>